there were a lot of uh, a lot of ideas for modes and for features that we wanted to incorporate into the base game. However, due to time constraints and pretty tight deadlines, we were forced to make some kind of uh, compromises there on the amount of content we released at launch. For the first expansion, uh, we knew from the get-go that we wanted to include some kind of endless mode. The thing about uh, survival is that you only have this one life, and it's about surviving as long as possible. Uh, this is, of course, in stark contrast with the main game, which has five levels, and once you finish them, that's it. There is an exception there with the master difficulty level in the arcade, because once you complete that, if you once you see the game, uh, you can restart in hero mode. Uh, but once you complete hero, there's no extra looping. That was actually a really conscious decision, because in Super Stardust HD, the game looped over infinitely. And a lot of the guys who were going for these world-class scores would be playing the game for four or five hours straight to reach those multi-billion high scores. And that's something we consciously wanted to avoid with Resogun. We wanted to keep the experience a little bit, well, a lot tighter. And that's why even in the survival mode, you can see that the difficulty curve is friendly enough for newcomers, but it is also fairly aggressive. So within 20 minutes, 25 minutes, you are really in trouble. Demon Souls and subsequently Dark Souls and so on were, have been a huge inspiration for me. And that's primarily where the idea of this fallen hero mechanic came from. It's effectively kind of your blood stain that you drop in the world. And if you manage to reach that point again, you're rewarded with, uh, with a shield and bonus points and so on. Like the, the people that were above you on the leaderboards are actually shown on the playfield as these floating statues. Those are the fallen heroes. So uh, I'm pretty happy with that mechanic and how it worked out. Originally, the demolition mode was supposed to be a bomber mode where basically you just press the button, you trigger a bomb, and you just try to stay alive and destroy as much stuff as possible. But uh, th there was a real drop in intensity there, you didn't feel that dynamic, it, it kind of felt like a lot of the intensity of the core Resogun experience was not there. So we thought, why not add balls to the mix? And by introducing the wrecking ball concept, and having power-ups focused on those wrecking balls, we were able to create something that uh, felt familiar but fresh at the same time. It was fleshed out a little bit after our return from the New York trip where we went to this arcade and I spent a couple of hours there playing Arkanoid and revisiting one of my favorite arcade games. And all of the, well, the balls bouncing around, the physicality there, the interaction that you have with the environment, it's kind of, I found that really interesting. So we integrated a bit of that gameplay into demolition mode. So we had already begun development on the ship editor way before uh, the base game was shipped, but it did take us a fairly long time to actually flesh out the, the interface and get all the features we wanted in that. Uh, one interesting side effect from the editor was that it, it forced us to revisit the balancing of the game because in the released game uh, there were three ship types and they were each balanced according to their stats and the strength of their weapons. And for example Phobos, which was the slower ship but with the massive overdrive, uh, also had this supremely overpowered weapon. And in the context of the original game that made perfect sense because you could not use that weapon anywhere else. Once we introduced the ship editor, you could have a ship that was full agility and with a Phobos weapon. And that basically, with uh, the settings we had for the arcade game, that would have allowed you to basically be practically invincible. So we needed to revisit that attribute uh, distribution and we needed to revisit the weapons. So we, we addressed those issues in a subsequent update and we restored the core uh, Resogun experience to a really balanced state. We have a lot of passion and we have a lot of creative minds working on the game and a lot of times some ideas come up 
they're easier to implement and prototype and with a little bit of extra effort we can actually have them in the game as well. So local co-op was a result of one of these extra kind of things we tried out. It worked well enough, people were asking for local co-op so we decided to deliver it and that was part of the free update as well. So with protector mode we tried to once again revisit the whole core Resogun formula but kind of flesh it out in a slightly different direction. So there's the shoot and survive mechanics, there's saving the humans, there's building up your cities there and having that sense of growth. There's all of these new power-ups. Uh, there's In the survival mode we had these sentinels which were kind of mini, like mini-bosses. In protector mode we replaced those with these city destroyers that come down, they look like these Independence Day kind of UFOs and they're, they're trying to destroy all of the hard work you put into creating these cities. In many ways I like to think that protector mode is the culmination of all our efforts to create uh, the most refined Resogun experience. We started experimenting with all these mini games and variations to the core gameplay and in its uh, original state commando mode was nothing more than uh, our take on missile command. So you had a static turret in the middle, you had houses left and right, and you had meteorites dropping down that you were shooting. So that got really repetitive really quickly, uh, but there was something there that we liked. So we thought, why not replace the main turret with a little human and make this guy be kind of one of the last surviving humans. And we did that and it was instantly clear to us that this is going to be the next mode. When we first started you had, of course, the human and you had many houses. Uh, we decided to remove all of the extra ones and keep only one house in the middle because that created a larger sense of attachment with your home, in a way. And, of course, Ari, our music guy, is a, is a great musician, but he also does a really mean Arnie impersonation. So it was actually pretty clear to make the connection there. Commando mode, 80s action movies, Arnold impersonator. It was a match made in heaven. Uh, with Defenders, we also released it alongside a free update to the game. This free update in many ways changed the core Resogun experience in many ways because it introduced uh, a ranking system. So now you Basically, the more time you put into the game, the more you complete uh, these different objectives and goals, the more you will get these challenge points, and the more your rank will increase, and the more content you will unlock. One of the things that we have uh, in the free update is also challenges. So these are basically variations to the core gameplay, kind of like mini-modes of their own, if you like. Uh, these add really... Mm, uh, really subtle to really bizarre variations to the core gameplay. They have exclusive leaderboards and they, they, they spice up the Resogun gameplay quite a bit. Uh, there's for example Super Revenge Bullets, there's you know a challenge where you uh, where every enemy that you destroy releases a human. These are all ideas that we had tried out in the game and had been interested in at different points of development. And now, in many ways, players get to experience them through the form of these challenges. One great example here is the Super Stardust challenge, where you get to actually use this 360 shooting. Uh, that was originally prototyped, we didn't like it, but it also, a bit, including this as a challenge, allows us to have the best of both worlds. So players can experience these fresh challenges, uh, while the core game still remains really balanced and focused on the core Resogun experience. One of the one of the other features we included in the uh, Challengers expansion was the concept of feats. So in many ways these are kind of like in-game trophies that you can unlock. The idea here was that we got really good uh, feedback from our from our fans about the trophies that we had in the game. So we thought why not add a couple of hundred of them. 
and of course there are uh, both the free update and the expansion have their own trophies but these add extra uh, extra goals for the players to achieve that cover a broad range of skill levels and by completing these feats you can also get more challenge points and and increase your your ranks and you can also compare the feats that you've completed and uh, challenges that you've completed with your friends so i guess this was just one other way that we wanted to to extend lo the longevity of the game because this is the, the this is sadly the very last expansion for the foreseeable future for wrestlegun and we really wanted to ensure that we go out with a bang and leave the game in the best possible state for players to enjoy for many years to come. Uh, overall, it's, it's a little bit bittersweet to be honest, because on the one hand it's great to finally, finally reach this part where we can look back and, and look on Resogun as a complete package now. It has all of the expansions, it has lots of different modes, lots of content, and we're really happy to see it kind of as a game that can hopefully stand the test of time. It's always, it's always a little bit sad to let go of such a great project because we've had a really great time developing it. Uh, it's been a privilege working alongside so many talented developers here at Housemark to bring this game to life. And we've also raised the bar pretty high for ourselves. So now we have to make sure that our next game is even better than WrestleVan. Basically, in every company you have some hierarchy. And of course you have like lead designers, you have lead uh, programmers, you have creative directors and so on. But ultimately there's a certain authority that's above any of us and that's the game itself. So the game is the boss, the game always comes first and we should always learn to keep our ego out of the equation. As hard as it is, try to not get too emotionally attached to things that you know, we feel might be great but simply don't work in practice. And just listen to what the game is telling us. That's what I've learned the most. <laughs>